Greetings, owners of fine luxury cardboard rectangles. I am the magic historian, and it's time to do some historification. What I have here in my gorgeous model-like hands, honestly, I could have I could have worked for the prices, right? You know what I'm saying? A little bit of Bob Barker action? Forget the Drew Carey days. Anyhow, talking and talking about the past, we have Inquest number one, all the way back from 1995. Look at this sexy vampire lady who's eating a bird. Oh, dinner. That's, that's not, that's not good. Anyhow, I was taking a wander through the very first Inquest, and I came across an article that I thought would be a lot of fun to talk about. This is an addict's account of pricing collectible cards. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through all of this article here. We're gonna talk about the individual cards that were brought up, cause I'll have my own little personal anecdote notes to include with it. Now, I want you to notice the way this is described. Look at that, look at what it says. Look at what it says about Magic players collecting cards in 1995. They're not wrong. They are not wrong with this. So, uh, once, once we get into the cards, I'm gonna start reading from this so you can see me reading all oh, like this and then we will progress to actually putting some card images up on the screen as we talk about the cards. Magic is a dangerous thing. Yeah, I'd heard of the game before I learned to play it last December. It seemed interesting. But when I moved my eyes over the comic book counter to the magic cards, I saw the 70, 70, the 7.99 price tag on the starter decks. 7.99 for a starter deck. That's a, that is a while ago. It didn't matter that a couple of guys noticed my interest and told me how great the game was. The price tag was too high. And people's recommendations usually don't carry much weight with me since my second grade teacher told me to try chocolate covered ants and buttermilk. Not at the same time, but they were still terrible. Then Mike Cyril, the evil editor of Inquest, taught me how to play. He even gave me my own deck. Commons, but still neat. I soon broke through the surface tension of the magic pudding and got stuck. I went from $8 is a lot for a deck to $8 is a lot for one card to want to buy $140 for Black Lotus, must be near mint, email with replies. All in the span of two months. And you can see on the screen here, we have the Black Lotus. Imagine that. Imagine being able to get a Black Lotus for $140. People will be tripping all over themselves for that. I remember actually, when I started, Lotuses were worth uh, like 25, something like that. They were they were not not this high even. This is this is pretty crazy. But yeah, I mean I had I had a lotus back in the day. I almost destroyed my lotus. I was playing a game of magic and I was leaned back in my chair. My lotus got knocked off the table. So I started to lean forward. Now, when I say knocked off the table, more like knocked into the air. So the card got flipped up into the air and I'm leaning forwards trying to catch my black lotus. But as I lean forward to catch the lotus, I come up to the edge of the table and the card lands right between me and the table. So the edge of the table and my body are both pressing on either side of the Lotus. If you've ever seen a bend test, we were essentially doing a full on bend test on the Lotus with the danger of snapping my Lotus in half. I mean, it wouldn't technically snap, but you know, you guys have seen the cards with the crease lines on them. You do not want that to happen. Such, such a crazy long time ago, thinking about playing it at my parents' place, all oh, that. That Lotus is long gone. So the article continues. Since last fall, magic, magic shot out of the back room, single-handedly revitalizing and overshadowing the entire fantasy gaming industry. It's a dangerous thing. Devoted players can spend money on the game like rats on Coca-Cola. It doesn't actually say Coca-Cola. It says what it says at the top of the article there. But YouTube is pretty picky about what they hit you with the uh, demonetization for. So I'm just gonna go ahead and avoid that word. Let's just put that one to the side. Like rats on Coca-Cola. So most people, however, have limited budgets and zero in on the most useful cards. It'd have been better if I had known beforehand 
which cards were going to go up in price. Now, this is something we've heard a ton of Magic players lament about. I wish I had known how much these cards were going to be worth. I wish I knew which cards were going to turn out to be valuable. I had so many of these cards, I would have kept them. And it's like, if you could go back in time, you could do so many other things that would improve your life so much more. I guarantee you, you could have a Magic player and all their hair is falling out and their eyesight is terrible and you could medically know, oh, if I went back in the past and actually ate vegetables and exercise, I'd be healthier and happier now. But they wouldn't do that. They'd be like, nope, I got eight more copies of Birds of Paradise. Like, that's, that's what we're looking at. Anyhow, the article says, Hercules Recall, once 50 cents, now sells around for around four dollars. This low casting cost card returns the target player's artifact to his hands and can crush artifact heavy decks. It's funny to think about Hercules Recall being used to hose artifact decks when a lot of the time Hercules Recall would actually be used, at least more, more nowadays, to just return all your artifacts to your hand. Imagine playing a bunch of Moxes, you play a Sol Ring, you tap them all these artifacts for mana, and then you play Hercules Recall, play them all, get them all back to your hand, and play them all again for an insane amount of mana. That is more along the lines of what Hercules Recall would be used for in a current environment. It's cute to think of it as a, I'm gonna get you, I'm gonna hose you with my Hercules Recall. Ah, oh, the, these, these old school cards bring back such, such pleasant memories. Enchantment Alteration. Have you, look at this card on the screen right now. Look at Enchantment Alteration. Have you ever seen or heard of this card in your life? The answer is most likely no, although I do have a bunch of nostalgia bros on the channel, so it is possible. So Enchantment Alteration, long ignored, is creeping into the $2 range. Undo your opponent's plans and enhance your permanence with his enchantments. In my entire life, in my entire life of Magic the Gathering, like, we're talking all the way back to like 1994 when I started, which is when Enchantment Alteration came out, by the way. I have never seen a single person play this card in their deck, let alone actually live the dream of using it. I have never, ever, ever seen anybody use this card, not once. Moving on, Berserk, a game breaker, has risen from $8 to $16 since December. Oh my god, can you imagine getting a, can you imagine getting an unlimited berserk for $16? <laughs> Someone blocked your big creature with a 1-1? One, one? Berserk it. Sure you lose your creature, but surprise, your opponent is dead. Berserk is a buck nutty card, and obviously when it comes to um like the infect decks and stuff like that, Berserk's just completely out of control. Really, really strong, really sweet card. So, a, card, a card's availability has a lot to do with its price. If you can't get a card, it'll be worth more, even when useless. This is true. There were a bunch of useless cards from Legends, but since Legends was really hard to acquire, these cards had ridiculous price tags. Just ridiculous price tags. Circles of Protection <laughs> and Prodigal Sorcerers are extremely useful, but not very valuable. There's more out there than unsold cases of Crystal Pepsi. Dude, I loved Crystal Pepsi. I was totally in to Crystal Pepsi when I was when I was younger, and I was totally into Circles of Protection as well. I had a buddy who played with the Prodigal Sorcerers, but Circles of Protection seemed so busted to me that I remember <laughs> I remember going to the local game store and going through the binder of singles, and I happened upon Circle of Protections, and they were in there for it was either 10 or 20 cents. They were incredibly cheap. I think it might've been 10 cents. And so I literally said out loud and the store owner heard me and made fun of me about it for years afterwards. Hurry up and buy them before he finds out there's a mistake. And so <laughs> I bought four copies of every circle. And then I went home and angrily called my best friend because he was playing with the circle protection red and all circles of protection do is stop sources of damage, right? But he used a circle red to stop my stone rain. I played a stone rain targeting his land and he paid one with the circle. And I just was like, oh, I guess that's what that does. Like I didn't read the cards at first because I trusted my friends to read and understand the cards properly. But after having people cheat against me with circles and rocket launchers, 
I said, no more, I'm reading every card. But yeah, the, this I got home, I thought circles could stop anything. It's like, oh, are you playing black? I got to circle black. I can stop everything with this. You want to tear one of my creatures? No, not happening. Not on my watch. But no, circles just stop damage. That being said, I still did have a lot of fun with circles of protection over the years. Uh, <laughs> the memories of when I was a noob from talking about these cards. The next card is triggering another noob memory, a noobery. The discontinued Word of Command sells for $37. Word of Command was a huge deal when I started playing Magic. Word of Command was one of the absolute most sought after cards. Obviously things like Moxes and Lotuses, stuff like that is going to come ahead of it, but Word of Command was something people really, really wanted. So the article says, it lets you look at your opponent's hand and cast one of his instants or sorcery spells with his mana. Sounds neat, but think about it. The best you can hope for is for him to fireball himself. I think some kid in Kansas got this to work right. However, it's $37 only because it's impossible to get. It was difficult to get, but people like, people did play it. I remember I was such a noob that I didn't even realize I could play an instant in response to my opponent playing one. So he played word of command on me. I have a psionic blast in my hand. So psionic blast is an instant. I could have cast it in response targeting him or one of his creatures and taking two damage, but he played word of command. I let him look in my hand and then he made, he, he made me side blast myself. So I ended up taking six damage from my own side blast. <laughs> oh, I felt so stupid later when I was like, oh man, I could have cast it in response. Oh, the days of Newbery. The article continues. So the overpowering determination of what a card's worth is its availability. But the playing value is what's going to make the dollar value go up. Elder Dragons won't appreciate much. They're rare and neat as heck, but they're so difficult to play with that they're stuck at $25 each. I was only able to buy three packs of Legends ever in my life. And that was in one day. I actually managed to get one of the Elder Dragons from, from a booster pack. And everybody at the store went nuts. Everybody was trying to trade it off of me. People wanted the Elder Dragons more than they wanted Moxes and Lotuses and stuff. Because we didn't have like just an obsession with the most technically powerful cards. We had an obsession with big, dumb, stupid nonsense. And the Elder Dragons are big, dumb, stupid nonsense. If you're wondering which one I got, I got Vevictus Asmadi, Asmadi? I still don't know how it's pronounced. Vevictus Asmadi is what I called him. Now, the adorable part is, I did what a lot of noobs do. People get like, when everyone around you is hyped about a card, you're like, I'm gonna play with it. So when I get this Elder Dragon, you'll notice that his casting cost has like black, red, and green. At least I believe those are the colors. I don't have the card in front of me while I'm saying this, but I believe those are the three colors. If not, just adjust the story for a different basic lands type. The important part is this dragon had green in it, and I was already playing a green deck. So I, I jammed this Elder Dragon into my 120 card green deck along with three mountains and three swamps in the whole deck. How are you supposed to get two of those colors with only three of each of those lands in a 120 card deck? But I didn't know that. I was living the dream and I had big stupid unwieldy ways to get him out there where basically I would rely on things like Glyph of Reincarnation. Yes. Glyph of Reincarnation. You literally have to play this on a wall and you already have to have the dragon in your graveyard. So my plan was to hold cards into my hand until I had too many cards, discard this dragon to my graveyard. Then I had my opponent, I had to have out a wall. So I had to attack into a wall, then play the glyph to get the dragon out. Now I did manage to do it once, but that one time, my friends, was absolutely glorious. It made me genuinely happy. Oh, those were, those were simpler times. Man. Article continues. The game-breaking Black Lotus may soon reach the $200 level as easily as the $100 mark is surpassed only too recently. And then the article continues onward saying the rules are true for other games as well. Talks about Star Trek. I'm just going to kind of skip over that and move to the next part of the article where it says... If you've been eyeing a card you could really use but haven't bought, yet, bought it yet, you may be making a mistake. 
if it's useful to you, it's probably useful to everyone, and the price may rise out of reach. Of course, new releases affect the price of existing cards. Leviathans are stuck at eight to nine dollars. Oh my God, guys, Leviathan. Here's what you have to understand. When you look at Leviathan, your brain is going to recoil in horror. You're gonna go, this is awful. This card is awful. Look, it's got four blue in its casting cost, plus five colors. You gotta pay nine mana for this thing. It's a 10-10 Trampler, but it comes into play tapped. It doesn't untap during your untap phase. To untap it, you have to sacrifice two islands. And to attack with it, you have to sacrifice two islands. Imagine this in standard. Just imagine, like, take a look at the card that's on the screen right now, and imagine this being in Throne of Eldraine. Who would play this? Who would, you might, you might, might play it in a draft, maybe. But the card is awful. But when it came out, it was the best. It was the biggest creature in the entire game. I played with Leviathans. It <laughs> just is so bad though. It's so bad. So it says, Leviathans are stuck at eight to nine dollars. The biggest creature in Magic costs two islands to untap or attack, but Ice Age is Norit, a black creature that untaps blue creatures, free in, in whatever guide to comics, makes the Leviathan easier to use, hence more valuable. Check it out, boys! If you combine this four cost Norit with your Leviathan, the Leviathan becomes more valuable and awesome. You can also twiddle it for extra value. Guys, it was $9. It was $9. Now a original printing, the Dark Leviathan, is only $6. And that's what people do in all these bio to old cards and investing in old cards and the card being like 24 or 25 years old. It's only worth six bucks. It's only worth two thirds of what it was 25 years ago. How amazing is that? So the article finishes by saying new releases could also hurt the values of existing cards. More on this next issue when I look at the effect, uh, the effect upcoming Magic sets like Ice Age Chronicles and the fourth edition of Magic's basic set might have on the market. My God, my friends, it is so cool to have these magazines. I have to, I have to big, give a big shout out to those fans of mine who have sent me novels, the old school magazines. You guys know who you are. All of you make doing this so much more enjoyable because honestly, this is such a nice nostalgic taste of magic's past it just it it genuinely just brings me back to the insane heady days of the beginning of magic the gathering where leviathan was a big deal and i was so inept that i didn't know to play instance in response to instance and it was it was just back when magic was just when it was just really just a game rather than this big sprawling behemoth it's become and don't get me wrong Obviously, people like me, I mean, I, my channel is built around magic. I'm perfectly happy with what it's sprawled into, but it is nice to take that trip down memory lane. Honestly, the article was far more enjoyable than I thought it was going to be. The title, the title is what caught my attention. I'm just like, what? And I'm like, they're not, they're not wrong. And then when I read it, I'm like, oh, so many glorious memories. So my friends. Let me know what you think about all of this back in the day. Would you rock a Levi <laughs> Leviathans? They're so bad. Oh, big creatures always had to have massive drawbacks back then. It's not the rule anymore, which is good because it's a stupid way to do things. Either way, I really appreciate all of you coming by and hanging out with me. Big shout out to all my patrons and channel members who will be listed at the end of the video. Thanks for being here, everybody. I will see all of you people here tomorrow.